Yes, this is a long book when you do it just a couple of stories at a time. Yeah, but I'm having a fun journey. How about you? Mm-hmm. So once again, we are revisiting my bedtime book of two-minute stories, edited by Rosemary Garland and illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Now, I don't think we've brought it up in a while, but it's interesting that Rosemary Garland both has stories in the book and is the editor. You would think that would be a little biased there. I don't know. Maybe it was just a group of people who wanted to get together and she was the one who originally came up with the idea, as I've stated before. Also, these illustrators worked hard. I wonder how long it took to put this book together. No idea. Today's stories are Joey Knows Best by Rosemary Garland and Surprise for Victoria by Rosemary Bromley. Joey Knew Best. Mrs. Buffles had a parrot, a little green parrot called Joey, which she kept in her greenhouse next to the kitchen. Mrs. Buffles spent a lot of time in the greenhouse, busy amongst her flower pots planting bulbs and seeds. One day, Jill and Giles were with her, and she let them talk to Joey. Joey said, Pretty Polly, pretty Polly, and sometimes other things like, Close the door. May I feed him? asked Jill. Yes, said Mrs. Buffles, and she gave Jill some bird seed. Is bird seed real seed? asked Giles. I mean, if I plant it, will it grow? Yes, of course, said Mrs. Buffles. I'd love to grow some, said Jill. Then you shall have some, said Mrs. Buffles. May I have some too, asked Giles. Yes, said Mrs. Buffles, and I will give a prize to the one who grows the tallest plant. Oh, then may I choose one that's not in Joey's bowl, asked Giles. Which would you like, asked Mrs. Buffles. That big bulb over there, said Giles. Greedy lad, greedy lad, said the parrot. Jill chose some small striped seeds from Joey's bowl. And when they went home, they planted their seeds and the bulbs in the little patch of garden outside the kitchen door. They watered them and looked after them for such a long time before anything happened. Then Giles started growing first. I knew I would win, said Giles, because I chose the biggest. At last, Jill's seeds started sprouting, and soon it was quite quite an exciting race as Jill started catching up with Giles. Then Jill's plant was exactly the same height as Giles, and then it grew taller than Giles' plant. Giles measured his plant every day. It grew to about two feet, and soon a yellow flower burst out of its sheath. It's a daffodil, said Giles. Jill's plant went on growing and growing, but it didn't show any flower for a long time. Giles' flower looked lovely, but the plant stopped growing any taller. Jill had to push a stick into the ground to tie her plant and stop it from flopping over. Up, up, up went the plant, and then at last a flower appeared. The flower grew and grew. It was yellow, too, with a brown center. The size of the flower was first as big as a saucer, then as big as a little plate. Then it grew to the size of a large dinner plate. Jill had to stand on a stool to measure her plant now, and the big flower kept turning towards the sun. It's a sunflower, said Mother. At last, Mrs. Buffles came round to see who was the winner. She brought Joey with her on her shoulder. Jill is the winner, she said. But I chose the biggest to begin with, said Giles crossly. Greedy lad, greedy lad, said the parrot. Perhaps Joey is right, said Mrs. Buffles. The biggest thing does not always turn out the biggest in the end. And when Jill's flower has finished blooming, the center will be full of more sunflower seeds for Joey's breakfast. You must save them for him. And do you know what Mrs. Buffles did? She bought the seeds from Jill. That was Jill's prize. I was wondering why there was a sunflower on the second page. What I want to know is... Once her plant got so much taller than Giles plant, why did she keep measuring? Because she probably wanted to know how tall it would get. Just for her own curiosity. At first I thought she was trying to pick the sunflower seeds out of it, but then it was talking about the measuring and then I looked closely on oh, yep, there's the measuring tape. Yeah, the biggest seed doesn't always mean the biggest plant. I mean some of the largest trees out there are from tiny seeds you find in pine cones. 
And if you knew anything about plants, you go, oh, that's a bulb. It's going to be a flower. Not a big flower, one of those ones. And I can't remember if a bulb's an annual or a perennial? I think they qualify as annuals because they die back every year. But the thing is, they come back every year. Most annuals, you plant them, the season's over, they die, that's it. But bulbs actually come back, like iris, gladiolus, daffodils, paper whites. I remember this when I worked as a landscaper. And no one to my thoughts on art. Just look at how smug he is in that picture right there. That's a really good drawing. But you can see how, like, I'm going to win because I got this big seed right here. And I don't know why I went with that accent. Uh, also, the bird's well done. Uh, Joey is very well rendered. Cute bird. Cute bird. And there's a really nice fence over here in the shot where they planted both of the plants. Both of them are fully grown in this shot. So hers is really tall, going all the way up to the top of the page, and his is about halfway up the fence. And there's a cat that was never mentioned. Well, they never mentioned the snail either, so... Uh, well, the snail is kind of decoration, but I'm thinking a cat they own may have been mentioned. Cute little black and white cat. I think it's a... Is that a tuxedo pattern? Yes. Very nicely done. Look kind of cute. It's all surprised about how big the plant is. If you see the white paws and then you have the white part at the front, that would be the shirt front, where the black would be the jacket over the shirt. Ah, uh, shall we continue? <sighs> I'm not always afraid of this particular item, but sometimes the renders of them. I'll explain later. Surprise for Victoria. Victoria lived in an old house in the country. It had low beamed ceilings, large cozy fireplaces, and creaking floorboards. Yes, that actually was accented in the text. Victoria loved her home. She even loved its noisy floorboards, and when the house creaked at night, she snuggled down in bed, imagining the house was talking to her. She often wondered, too, about the people who had lived in the house before her mother and father had come to live there, and where she and her baby brother James had both been born. Our house is very old, isn't it, Mother? Victoria asked one day. How long have there been people living in it? Yes, it is very old, dear. Lots of families have lived here for over 300 years, said her mother. Victoria opened her eyes very wide. I wonder if there has always been a child sleeping in my bedroom, she said. I am sure there has been, said mother. Do you think that a child who lived here long, long ago would have been very different from me, inquired Victoria. Well, she would have worn very different clothes, replied Mother, but there would be a little girl very much like you inside them. I expect she liked playing with dolls and dressing up and having tea parties, just like you do. I'm glad, laughed Victoria. That evening, as her father bent over her bed to wish her good night, a floorboard gave a very loud squeak. Dear, oh dear, said Father, what a noise your floor makes. I must have a look at it tomorrow. I don't mind the squeaks, Daddy, murmured Victoria, and fell fast asleep. She dreamt about another little girl who had lived in her home many, many years before. And the funny thing was that her name was Victoria, too. The next morning, Victoria's father said, Let's go and see if I can stop that floor of yours creaking. Hand in hand, they climbed the old staircase to Victoria's room. They rolled back the carpet by her bed, and her father looked at the polished floor carefully. Ah, he exclaimed, here's the loose board, and he was able to lift it easily. There's quite a lot of space underneath the floor, isn't there, said Victoria, leaning over his shoulder. Yes, there is. Do you know, I think there's something hidden down there. And in all modern stories, this would be a very bad thing. Daddy, Daddy, what is it? What is it? Victoria squealed. Carefully, her father drew something out. At first, Victoria could not make out what it was. It was so very dirty. Why, it's a doll, she cried as the dust was gently brushed away. And a very old one, too, said her father. I wonder how long it's been there. Victoria stared at the doll. She saw two bright blue eyes staring back at her from a dainty china face. She saw that the rest of the doll's body was made of painted wood. And she saw that its dress had once been a very old-fashioned pretty muslin with flowers on it. 
and it was trimmed with lace. I think she's beautiful, whispered Victoria. I wonder who she belonged to. To another little girl who loved her very much, I expect, said Mother, who had just come into the room. Victoria smiled. And I shall love her just the same, she said. What will you call her? asked her mother. Victoria, said Victoria. But why call her the same name as yourself? asked her mother. Because I think I dreamt about her last night, and her name was Victoria in my dream, said Victoria. Cute little story. And not all the modern ones would go wrong there. Though, going back to what I reacted to at the beginning before we started reading, just something about the doll's faces, the way they've been rendered. This is the second doll drawn by this particular artist because it's back to the two-color palette. Just something about the way the eyes, they just stare into your soul. Yeah, so in that case, they capture dolls pretty well. <laughs> and... The art is fabulous. This house is well done. Got some nice details. A tree in the background. Got all the roof tiles. And the doll is well rendered, including this nah, the face. Got a nice hand reaching down to pick it up. I'm not quite sure if it's the daughter's or the father's. I think it's supposed to be the daughter's based on that bracelet. Yeah, I would think more likely the daughter, mainly based on the bracelet. So I think I see a poem on this page. Butterflies. Butterflies have painted wings with eyes on stalks and legs like strings. You can see them come and go, fluttering in the summer glow. From flower to flower, they love to play, but only live for one whole day. Hmm. Well, that's not depressing or anything. <laughs> Though there are some butterflies that live much longer than that, like I believe monarchs? Yes. It's really mayflies? Yeah, a lot of flies are usually it's like within 24 hours to a week and then bleh. Yeah. So, what did you think? Well, I remember Joey knew best. Animals and gardening. Okay, obviously I read that one a lot. Another one with the house and a dog. I didn't really play house, so... <laughs> this one, not so much memory. It's still nicely done, but it's interesting the variations on when there is or is not a poem. They use so many different things to keep the stories to two pages. Because here on Surprise for Victoria, we have two pictures that relate to the story itself, but the poem about butterflies takes up a half page because it's only three stanzas, but it has three sets of pictures of butterflies, one above, one in between the first and second stanzas, and two at the bottom. And I think, let's see, one, two, three, and I think there's four different butterflies, or five. There are five total. And then if you look at Joey Knew Best, it has three pictures, but one picture takes up three quarters of the page. And it's actually very easy to tell with the way that pictures are arranged. And then you go back to something like Dancing Pins, and it has three pictures related to the story and still has a poem. It was just really interesting how they divvy up the pages. I never even really thought about the layout of the pages that much. I kind of just looked at them and went, these pictures are nice, this is a nice large one. But the size and number of pictures affects how much text is on the pages. Especially since I don't see that they've changed the font size at all. Mm -mm. It's very consistent. It's like, it's a reasonable size too. It's not the larger text that you see on a lot of other kids' books. It's about normal size, I would say. Yeah, probably about a 12 point. This was another installment of my bedtime book of two-minute stories with Joey New Best by... Rosemary Garland, and Surprise for Victoria by Rosemary Bromley. Thanks for listening. Okay, I know you guys have heard all this before. Like, subscribe, share, comment, check out other videos. I mean, come on, there's a whole playlist just of two-minute stories. It's going to be really interesting when we get to the end of this book how long the total playlist time on that is.
I'll have to multiply out the total number of stories and go how long it should have taken us to read them <laughs> and how long our podcasts are. Not that it would be a one-to-one -one because commentary, intro, outro. Discussions. So to continue with the outro, <laughs> there are lots of other stories, not just my bedtime book of two-minute stories. And there's a whole bunch of pop culture stuff on the main section of the channel. Haven't picked up a copy of this book yet? Check for the Amazon link. Just want to go shopping? Snag the Ebates link. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content in the Lux Analysis channel.